So in fact, let me go ahead and finish off by talking about the single most important solution to this wave equation. And that is the plane wave. If you know the mathematical form of the plane wave, you know almost 80 or 90 percent of electromagnetic theory. Everything else is just sort of a, a modification of this concept, in my opinion. Um, so let's go ahead and, and, and write that. This is, an, is one example of a solution to the Helmholtz wave equation. And it's a useful solution for a couple reasons. Um, it's a very simple mathematical form. And what's more, in real life, when we make waves, so to speak, in electromagnetics, let's say you've got an antenna, for example. How does the antenna make a wave? You slosh current up and down, which changes the E field and the H field, couples them together, and that causes an electromagnetic disturbance to travel away from the antenna. Once you get to a certain part, you can kind of treat it as a perfect spherical wave. And once that wave travels far enough and strikes another antenna, let's say here's your wave coming out, once it strikes another antenna, by the time it does that, in the region near the antenna, it looks kind of like a plane wave. The radius of curvature has bowed out and gotten so large that you might as well just treat it locally as a plane wave. Uh, and then from that, you can figure out how much power this thing receives. So this is one of the reasons why, why uh, the plane wave is so important. Because even for realistic, there's no such thing as an actual pl true plane wave. But everything is kind of approximately a plane wave if you look at it from the right angle. So let me show you exactly the form of electric and magnetic field that solve the Helmholtz wave equation. This is a generic form, and I'll unpack each of the terms individually. So we have E phasor vector as a function of three-dimensional space. So there I'm going to introduce my shorthand R vector notation. And if it solves Maxwell's equations in a simple source-free media, then it must have the following form. It's got to have an amplitude, E naught. It must have a unit vector with a polarization, E hat, little e hat. It must have an E x p j and there is going to be some sort of phase, phi naught, minus wave number, k unit vector, dotted into r, my position vector. This has units, of course, of volts per meter. So let me go ahead, before I write the H field solution, and unpack all the variables that I used here. It's really not that complicated, but there's just a lot of stuff floating around. My R vector, that of course is X, my point of observation, X, Y, Z, where X, stick it on the X hat, Y, stick it on the Y hat, Z, stick it on the Z hat, a convenient way to keep track of where you are in space. And of course you read this, this is the electric field phasor vector at that point in space. E naught is equal to the amplitude of the E field wave. Units of volts per meter. E unit vector is called the polarization. of the wave. It points in the direction that the E field points. And the two of these together tell you the magnitude and the direction of the E field. This basically will just, this, anything that you append to this is really just a function of phase. And that phase is the only place where the positional dependence shows up. 
Now, of course, k, we said that was 2 pi over wavelength, also known as the wave number. Radians per meter are the units. Notice that E unit vector does not have units. It is one of the great ironies in life that unit vectors are always unitless. Let's see, what else do we have here? We have a phi naught, that is the phase in radians, and I have a k hat. This is another unit vector that points in the direction <coughs> of propagation. So I can make this mathematical expression describe a wave and solve the Helmholtz wave equation by just changing the direction of k hat. If I put it in the x direction, the x hat direction, then I have an x traveling wave. If I put it in the z hat direction, I get a vertical traveling wave. If I put it in like a skewed direction, I have a skewed traveling wave that picks a direction that comprises x, y, and z, some combination thereof. Dr. Dargan? Oh, yes. Could, yeah, uh, no, we just couldn't see the bottom of the board. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay, so this, that's our E field. I think I covered every term in that. Yes? I don't really get what polarization is. Well, this is an electric field, right? And we know that electric field, how do we define it? Force over charge. There's always an amplitude relative to the force on a charge that would exist at that point. And there's always a direction, because every force in the world has a direction to it, right? And so, you know, this will tell you the amplitude and the phase of that sinusoidal force that if I put an electron at that point, you'd be pushing back and forth on it, wiggling it around. But you need the direction. So polarization, polarization tells you the direction. That isn't the direction picked up in there with the R vector? No, because remember, this is a scalar. This direction here just tells you what direction does the wave travel in space. It does not tell you what direction does the E field point. We'll okay. see in a second that these are actually related. These are related. So that kind of a good question that anticipates something uh, that we'll discuss in a minute. But yeah, this problem when there's like there are going to be three different vectors floating around in these equations, as we'll see, and they are actually all interrelated, but they mean different things. So wherever there's smoke, there's fire. So wherever there's E field, there also has to be a corresponding H field in Maxwell's equations to solve it. And for this, I can write the e f H field in this form. E naught over eta in the H hat direction times E x P j, and I have the exact same term. K, K hat, the direction of propagation, dotted into my point of observation. And this, of course, has units of amps per meter. Now, what are the variables that I've just introduced that weren't in the original one? H hat, and this is the direction of magnetic field, unitless. And eta, which is called the intrinsic impedance of the medium. Units of ohms. Units of ohms. This, of course, would have units of meters. I should have written this here. And this is it. If you write a mathematical solution like this, you will solve Maxwell's equations. And you will be describing a plane wave. In fact, 
This is a special kind of plane wave called the uniform plane wave because the amplitude is constant no matter where you observe in space. If you were to take the magnitude of this vector or this vector, then the actual amplitude of that vector would just be E naught. You know, this is a unit vector, so that doesn't change the amplitude. And this is just a phase term. This also doesn't change the amplitude. This would be E naught, this would be E naught over eta. And so it's uniform. And we call it a plane wave because if you set the phase here to a constant, geometrically that describes a plane in space. If you ratchet up the phase, you get another plane. If you ratchet up the phase value and set it equal, you get another plane. And so what you see is pl constant planes of phase moving along in space. That's really what this dis the, the geometrical description of this formula means. Now there's two other pieces of information I need to, to give you to complete this. And that is, go and, and get another board going here. You can't just pick an arbitrary impedance or arbitrary unit vectors there. The intrinsic impedance is equal to the square root of mu over epsilon, units of ohms. And it's very much like the Z naught that we learned in transmission line theory. Likewise, E crossed into H and I'll put a little asterisk there. I'll explain that in a second, but we won't use it in this class. But for completeness, I feel like I have to. My E unit vector crossed into H unit vector is equal to K unit vector. All you fans of the right-hand fan, uh, right hand rule, take your thumb, that's your E, cross it into H, and you get K, direction of propagation. In other words, these unit vectors are all mutually orthogonal to one another if they're solving the Helmholtz wave equation. Mutually orthogonal. So E is always perpendicular to H, and the direction of propagation is always perpendicular to both of those. Yeah. Ah, oh, yeah, 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 the asterisk. So technically, if you get into advanced EM classes, what you find is that these aren't just real valued unit vectors, they can be complex unit vectors if you have elliptical polarization. And so to keep the, the whole thing mathematically precise and physically complete, I should take the complex conjugate of this vector. In this class, we're only going to deal with real valued vectors anyway, so you just kind of ignore that. Just use your standard E cross into H is equal to K. Okay, one last thing. Well, tell you what, let's, let's work a problem. Let's, let's do an example. This will be helpful. What kind of question can I even ask with this type on, uh, on a homework or an exam? I think I'll give a practice problem on the, on the web for this just so that you can see what it looks like. But, here's my problem. You measure the following field solution for the electric field phaser. Minus 1 times 10 to the negative fifth volts per meter times the vector 4x hat minus 2y uh, hat plus z hat times exp minus j 
0 0.01 x hat plus 3y hat plus 2z hat dotted into r vector volts per meter. And so the question might ask, OK, you know this is your electric field. And I ask two questions here. What is the corresponding magnetic field that must accompany this if this is a true plane wave? And what direction, what wavelength is it, and what direction is it traveling? Can we actually pull that out of the mathematical form of the solution? We should be able to, because we kind of know what part goes to what physical aspect of the wave. So let's go ahead and do that. So first I'm going to complete the magnetic field solution. And in doing so, it'll be uh, very easy to see what the constitutive components are. So here's my solution. I got this mathematical expression of a wave. My electric field is equal to, OK, let's see here. Let's see here. Well, I got to put it in the same form that I had on the previous board, which means I need an amplitude and I mean a, need a unit vector. And in that mathematical statement, I've got an amplitude and a vector, but it's not a unit vector, so I'm going to have to normalize. Do you remember your, your uh, operation of normalization of a vector? You take a vector that's not a unit vector, like 4x minus 2y hat plus z hat, and you divide it by the length of that vector, which of course is the square root of 4 squared plus 2 squared plus 1 squared. And that should give me my e hat. Now, that's going to be 16 plus 4 plus 1, that's 21. So let me go ahead and write that out. This unit vector that I'm going to put in here is 4 over the square root of 21, x hat. Let's see, minus 2 over the square root of 21, y hat, plus 1 over the square root of 21, z hat. And if I divide it out by the square root of 21, then I got to multiply out the outside by the square root of 21, right? Mm -hmm. So when I go ahead and do that, what I really get is minus 4.58 times 10 to the negative fifth volts per meter on the outside. <coughs> but now I've got my E, E naught, and I got my E hat. That makes it really nice. Really nice. Now I got to clean up the rest of this stuff too. We erase this. Everybody got this in their notes? No. Okay. So one over. Oh no. Never mind. One times square root of one is four point fifty-eight. That's right. That's right. I got divided it in here to get a unit vector. I got to multiply it out here to so that I don't change the physical value that I'm dealing with. And I've got to do the same thing for that unit vector inside the exponent, the complex exponent. I, I need a k hat, and I've got a vector in there, but it's not a unit vector. So let me unpack that. I've got exp minus j, let's see, 0 0.01. And what I have inside is if I normalize it, it's 1 over the square root of 14 x hat plus 3 over the square root of 14 y hat plus 2 over the square root of 14 z hat dotted into my r vector. And if I divide through by square root of 14 to convert that unit vector into uh, or to convert that vector into a unit vector, I got to multiply by the square root of 14 out here. Putting it into the magic pack ca uh, professor calculator where everything is calculated ahead of time, I find 
that this is actually two pi over one sixty eight. Let's see. Well, why did I write it as two pi over one sixty eight instead of the actual number that it is? Point zero something something. Yeah, I can. This allows me to pull out one of the physical quantities. This is wave number, which is actually two pi over wavelength. And so the wavelength here is actually one hundred and sixty eight meters. Very low frequency wave. Remember, this follows the exact same traveling wave frequency and velocity relationship, frequency wavelength velocity re relationship that you learned in physics and all of your traveling wave uh, material. Frequency times wavelength is the velocity of propagation. For the wave that we're looking at, this is actually 1 over the square root of mu epsilon. All Maxwellian waves satisfy this criterion where if they're traveling in a simple medium consisting of permeability mu and permittivity epsilon, one over the square root of those two real constants should give you the velocity of propagation. If this were free space, this would be epsilon naught, this would be mu naught, and this would be 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So what's the frequency of this wave? This looks to be about 2 megahertz to me. If I divided that in through, I'd get about 2 times 10 to the 6th, um, 2 megahertz. Pretty low frequency, lower than your FM band, getting into your close to your AM band. So that's how I was able to pull out some uh, meaningful physical information from this mathematical structure. There's something else I can pull out too, and that is, what is the, uh, well first of all, what is the H field? Now that we've pulled out all this information, I can now write my H field. It's going to be this exact same number divided by the impedance of the medium. If this is free space, the intrinsic impedance is the square root of mu naught over epsilon naught. And if I plug in my actual constants to that, that's the magic value of 377 ohms. 377 ohms. E and H are always in that ratio perpendicular to one another in free space as they travel. Yeah, Laura. Um. Why did you, okay, you wanted to get the wave number k to buy over lambda. But when you look over here, your, your wave number is not multiplying the whole thing. It's just multiplying your k hat. Yeah, that's r. right. So this is my k hat. Uh, this is my k. Okay. And then I'm dotting my k hat into my so r your vector. So your Phase is zero degrees or something? Yeah, I, I just said it equal to zero because I didn't the original formula didn't have any additional stuff added on the year. Okay. If I wanted to, I could actually erase this and then put like a, a J pi there. Okay. My phase could be 180 degrees. Okay. Oh yes. You said you said something about magical ratio keeping nature but you said it kind of quickly and under your <laughs> So the, the magic ratio of 377 ohms, it's the ratio of each field volts per meter to H field amps per meter in free space. So whenever any wave, whether it's light or radio or X-ray or cosmic ray or whatever, if it's an electromagnetic wave, it has to have travel with those two ratios, E to H, is 377 ohms, that ratio. That's the intrinsic impedance of this three-dimensionless nothing transmission line that exists in our world. So let's see, let me finish off this so we have it in our notes. This is minus 1.22 times 10 to the negative 7 amps per meter times the unit vector in this case, my h hat, is 1 over the square root of 6. Stick it on the x, minus 1 over the square root of 6. Stick it on the y, minus 2 over the square root of 6. Stick it on the z. That's my h hat. 
How on earth did I come up with that? Well, what, the nice thing about factoring everything into an E hat and a, and a K hat is that not only do you have the direction that the E field points and the direction that the wave travels in, but you can calculate what H is through that simple formula. E crossed into H is equal to K hat. So bear with me, right hand rulers, get out your hand. E crossed into H is equal to K hat. If you know your E and you know your K hat and you want to find H, how do you do it? E crossed into H is equal to K. So K crossed into H, E should be equal to H, right? And that's all you have to do. K crossed into E is equal to H hat. The beauty of mutually orthogonal unit vectors. So all I needed to do, and I will not do, go through the tedium of that on the board, but you just need to take this K that we found, cross it into this E, and this is actually what comes out of that computation. The rest of the actual solution is the same. EX B to the minus JK, J 2 pi, 168. Same stuff. Now, there's one more piece of information that I want to pull out of this for completeness. And that is the physical direction of propagation. This is a, another useful quantity to pull out of your waves. What is... the bearing angle or the direction of travel of this wave that we know is 1 over the square root of 14x hat plus 3 over the square root of 14y hat plus 2 over the square root of 14z hat. If you are trying to steer a satellite dish antenna, a dish towards the direction of propagation, maybe you're trying to um, pull the, some information from a satellite in, or maybe you're doing radio astronomy or something, and uh, your scientific supervisor asks you, what direction is this wave coming from? If you proudly stand up and say, 1 over the square root of 14 x hat plus 3 over the square root of 14 uh, y hat plus 2 over the square root of 14 z hat, you will probably get slugged in the face and laughed out of the, the group. No, instead we want angles. We want geometry. So, let's convert this to something a little more physically meaningful. And to do that, I'm going to give you a generic formula for it. Let's start with our right-handed coordinate system. X hat, Y hat, Z hat. And if you have a K vector of the form KX, stick it on the X hat plus KY, stick it on the Y hat, plus KZ, stick it on the Z hat. The first thing you want to do is calculate the azimuth, the direction of arrival with respect to the x-axis. Now here's a little subtlety that gets a lot of students. Um, if a truck is coming down the road and you know its velocity vector. I say I'm a truck. Right? I got a velocity vector like this. I'm cruising down the road. And you're trying to explain to someone what direction is the truck coming in, and, and they're about to step in front of it. You don't go, hey, stop, look over there. You always negate the velocity vector, right? You say, oh, it's coming from that direction. So we talk about where waves are coming from. If you want a physical description, we got to do the same thing. X hat is the dire direction of propagation. If it points in this direction the way I've drawn it, then that actually means that it's arriving from below. And you would say, oh, look, look at that direction. That's where it's coming from. So if I ask for the direction of arrival, the 
the DOA then I look at the geometry of minus k hat does everybody understand that? and I try to figure out where what is phi and theta of minus k hat so in order to do that we have formulas for this that we've used already but I'll go ahead and put it on the board and adapt them to this particular situation for DOA of a wave phi is equal to remember we got two cases arc tangent of y over x if x is less than zero and it's less than zero instead of greater than zero because we've negated k hat should be ky kx and then we got to add 180 degrees if x is greater than zero theta, my angle of elevation, and I'm going to give you a little bit different of a formula for this. We're going to do theta with respect to the horizon, not the z-axis. So make sure you put this in your notes as a qualifier because when you go into the, you know, every field's got its own set of conventions. When you go into the field of radio wave propagation, Usually they never measure anything from zero degrees or zenith. They measure it from the horizon often. So how far above the horizon do you have to point your array or your dish antenna to get a radio wave? And if that's the case, then what we're really measuring is that angle in there. And we also got to negate it. So I got a minus arc tangent kz this length over this length which is actually the square root of kx squared plus ky squared and that's how I compute direction of arrival for this particular unit vector if I went in and actually plugged in the numbers what I'd find is that theta is minus 32 degrees actually it looks like it's coming up and phi is 252 degrees. Compute in radians, but always report in degrees. This is physically intuitive. This is mathematically correct when you hit all the buttons with radians. You just convert by multiplying by 180 over pi, right? Everybody knows that formula by heart, I hope. By this stage in your life, you probably do. So here, we've pulled off, we started out with an ugly mathematical expression, but we pulled off a lot of useful information. What does the corresponding H field look like? Which direction is this wave actually traveling? What's a wavelength? What's the amplitude of the H field? Looks pretty good now. And I'll put another example problem up on the, on the web for this, since we just finished off. But do you have any questions?